Welcome everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Joseph Carringer, and I'm gonna be discussing uh, the instruments that you see here, the didgeridoo, as they apply to sound therapy. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the instrument also, so a little historical information on it. And then we're gonna do a basic didgeridoo journey or didgeridoo meditation. And, um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me here in your town and in your library. Thank you for um, So the instrument, these are these two here, and then I'll explain a little bit more about these two over here. But this uh, dish here is a traditional termite hollowed uh, eucalyptus didgeridoo. Uh, the company that I work with in Karanda is a company called Did Shop that still uses traditional Aboriginal harvesters to go out and listen to hear if there's a didgeridoo inside the tree. Um, they're a sustainable company. I like working with them and they're really the com only company that I will get my digits from and my students because of the fact that they still use the Aboriginal harvesters. Um, there's been over the last couple decades a, uh, a tendency of non-Aboriginal harvesters for eucalyptus digits to go out and clear cut 100 trees to find a single didgeridoo because they don't know how to listen properly to it. Uh, that sounds really bad for the trees, which it's actually not. Eucalyptus grows like a weed. It shoots up from the ground, uh, from the root system. It's at, but what it is bad for is the natural environment, the koala, the termites, the different, the different beings that live inside of that environment. Um, so I, all of my digits sustainably harvested, Aboriginal harvested, for the eucalyptus ones that I have. Um, the didgeridoo is estimated to be between 40 and 80,000 years old. That's the... Uh, that's, that's the estimate that if you go get on fact check me, how old is the didgeridoo? You're going to find a, uh, an about.com reference to the didgeridoo that's going to say it's, it's about 2,700. I think they say 23 or 2,700 years old. It's an incredibly inaccurate estimate. It's based on an archaeological estimate that has to do with a single cave painting that they found. And they carbon dated the cave painting. The cave painting came back at 2,700 years. And they said, oh, the didgeridoo is... 2,700 years old. I was an anthropology major, not an archaeology major. Big difference. And uh, in order for something to have enough cultural significance so that a, uh, an indigenous tribe or any peoples, doesn't matter who you are, any people to, to decide that they're going to put something into a painting of significance, and especially where you would have to go and make your paint and go through all of that effort and then find a place on a cave where you're going to do it, especially in, uh, in, in, a, tri in a tribal society. Um, it would have had to have had sign cultural significance. In order for something to develop cultural significance, it has to be around longer than the age of the painting. So even just padding it by a couple hundred years would have made sense, but he didn't do that, or she didn't do that. Um, up until I did a, an event this last year, uh, my belief was that, and the belief of the, the, the archaeological and anthropological community was that there was no uh, fossilized or ancient didgeridoos out there. There had never been one found. Uh, so there was no verification of the age. I did an event with Jose Carlo and Anna Forrest of Forest Yoga earlier this year. And Jose Carlo is uh, the curator of an Australian Aboriginal uh, arts and culture program that still uses nothing but Aboriginal uh, performers and traditional dancers inside of the troupe. And uh, when I was doing this event for them, when I was because I was the did player that they asked to, to perform at the event here in the United States, um, inside of his dis uh, discussion about the didgeridoo, he talked about how they have actually found a fossilized didgeridoo, or uh, uh, yeah, fossilized. So it's um, they uh, they now know that they're they have been around for at least tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So that estimate of forty to eighty thousand years is based on the anthropological. Uh, what we could call an anthropological record, an anthropological estimation, because the uh, Aboriginal people are, uh, they have a uh, oral tradition, and their oral tradition has been carried down for tens of thousands of years. They are the single oldest continuous culture that has lived on the planet. They outdate all other uh, human, human cultures on the planet. Up until about 200 some odd years ago, when European Australians showed up and kind of shifted the culture dramatically, and they took a little bit of a left turn in terms of it having been the same culture for the last tens of thousands of years. Um, so the uh, that the 
the Aboriginal tribes who the didgeridoo is indigenous to. So not all Aboriginal tribes in Australia have the didgeridoo because you have to have eucalyptus and termites, right? Uh, but for the tribes that do have it, it's included in their Dreamtime stories of creation. So the names will represent that story. So the one name that I can pronounce, there's like 35, 45 different names for the different tribes that had the didgeridoo, each one having their own Dreamtime story of creation. The only one that I can pronounce is Yadaki. It's also the most common one and I also, that you'll hear inside of Western culture, you'll hear Yadaki. Um, and partially I think it's because it's the only one that we can easily pronounce inside of uh, Western culture with our with our rooting in Germanic language. Um, and that Dreamtime story for Yadaki uh, talks about how an Aboriginal warrior in the Dreamtime, right? So in their belief system, and their spiritual belief system, the Aboriginal tribes have what's called the Dreamtime. And you have the Dreamtime of the spirit world, and you have the Dreamtime of the physical world. The Dreamtime of the spirit world is where you go to when you go to sleep at night, you pass on to the next life. It's a timeless time. It's what always has been, always will be. And when you go to the dream time of the spirit world, um, that's, where, that's where everything occurs. The dream time of the physical world, where we are now, this is the place where you come to experience the illusions of separateness, uh, emotion, all the different things we experience in a corporeal body that you wouldn't get to experience in the spirit world. So in the dream time of the spirit world, there was this aboriginal warrior named Nadaki who was walking through the dream time out back of the spirit world, and he came across a hollow log that he tripped over, kicked it, picked it up, looked at it, saw these white ants in it, shook the white, sand, white ants out, and heard that sound, and he blew into it. And when he heard that sound, he was intrigued by it, so he brought that log back to his camp, and when he sat down, he took, ran some hot coals through it to get the rest of the white ants out, put some beeswax on it, so that he would get a nice seal on the top, and then began to play, and as he played, he breathed in through his nose and out through his mouth, and he was able to make the sound go continuously. And as he was doing that, different animals in the dream time from the outback would come out. So he would have the kookaburra come out and call to him, and he would call back. The kangaroo would come out, go hopping by, and he would hop with it. And so these different sounds that the Aboriginal people started to adapt in playing the didgeridoo were representative of the animals they had in their environment, the language that they speak. So when I play, because what I do in my work, not an Aboriginal tradition at all, um, I've never been to Australia. I don't try to play the didgeridoo in an Aboriginal way. I never have. I have a tremendous respect for the Aboriginal people and their cultural traditions. And that story of Yadaki, which I just told, um, please, if you're interested in it, go, go read about it because my Reader's Digest version does not do it justice. <laughs> it's actually far more in-depth and far more beautiful than I can actually, uh, than I can actually tell. Um, but the, uh, the Aboriginal people, are not the only people that have a didgeridoo culture. So that's the other thing that I actually really like to bring forward as well. The, uh, they are the, f the first by, by far. There's no, and there's even a paper that came out um, that I, uh, there's a, 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 a university paper where they were actually checking the genome between the Aboriginal people and the Southeast Asians, the Filipinos, and how they migrated back and forth because they've really tried to figure out who came first, which way, which way did it go down, did it come up, and the Aboriginal genome is actually the oldest. Um, I am the tallest, whitest Filipino you've ever met. Um, I'm actually uh, I've got my 23 in me, and I can prove it to all of you. So, um, and I'm also um, part Cherokee. And the interesting thing about the Cherokee people is that, and the Filipino, is that when the Aboriginal people came up uh, as the Melanesians up out of Australia and in New Zealand, up into that China, that, that area of uh, mainland China. The Filipinos took a hard right, went swimming, went to the Filipino Islands. The Cherokees shot up and over and came down into the Carolinas. And those two groups of people genetically are the exact same. And so, uh, which I find fascinating being this person here in 2019 that I can look back at my genetic heritage and 
see that map that goes all the way back to, interestingly enough, carrying some of the Melanesian ancestry that this came from. You know, that small percentage that still shows. Uh, but what I do, again, not an Aboriginal tradition. Um, so from the, uh, the holistic standpoint, which is what I, which is what I do, um, there's three basic ways that I found that the instrument affects a person and how we, uh, when I started my practice in 2004, I was adopted in by a group of acupuncturists, massage therapists, chiropractors who I played the ditch for at a uh, holistic meeting and they were like, this is amazing, we're going to actually help you figure this thing out, and, um, which was really fortunate to have, to have that experience. And uh, so the first way the instrument affects somebody is through the, the very physiological. It's producing sound waves that are going between zero and a thousand hertz, conservatively. So you're looking at zero point something, which is infrasound. So super low and audible, big giant sound waves that our eardrum can't, uh, can't actually detect, but we can feel them. Uh, up to, again, that thousand hertz range, that's the average. I know for the amount of time I spend in the studio, it's closer to like 1300, 1800 hertz for me and these are these audible sound ranges, you can use infrasound in a physiological way, in a very similar way that we use ultrasound in medical applications for skeletal muscular work. So ultrasound being super high and audible. And those applications are everything from relief of muscle tension, muscle knotting, stimulating bone growth in the case of breaks, fractures, bone surgery, um, relief of migraine, insomnia, all these very, very physical uh, aspects. And really what that is, is it's just helping you to, it relaxes the body. So if you have a traumatized area, that sound wave helps the muscle just sort of let go and let go of that tension. Traumatized area relaxes, you get better vasodilation. Better vasodilation means you get better blood flow. Better blood flow means it's oxygenated better, which means it heals better because we all need oxygen to heal. Right? So not magic, not nothing, not rocket science, nothing very difficult to wrap your head around. Um, so that's the first way that the digit affects a person. The second way that the instrument affects a person is through the energetic. So this is where it starts to get a little bit into that holistic philosophy. And so the Aboriginal people, where they had that belief in the spirit world and the physical world, right? If you were to get sick in Aboriginal culture, and why this is such a detachment from their belief system, if you were to get sick in Aboriginal culture, it was because someone or something was casting dream time magic on you. So if you got sick, fall down and broke your leg, Someone was doing something to you over here in that dream time. So in order to fix that, you would have to go there to do that. So an Aboriginal medicine man would go into the dream time to work on you to fix you there. From a holistic perspective, that's not that far off from what we do holistically. Traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, all the different and multiple cultures convergently involve this understanding of a subtle energy system. The Inca, the Maya, the Tibetan, uh, the Cherokee here on this continent, we all, and actually through the continent, the Inca and the Maya, obviously on this continent as well, all had evolutions and understanding of a subtle, subtle energy system. And uh, the, f the most commonly accepted that we use in holistic medicine now here in, uh, in uh, today's modern applications are the traditional Chinese medicine and that Ayurvedic. Um, and what that's doing is giving you the ability to access as I describe it, access consciousness through consciousness, essentially. And what you're doing with sound is you're applying sound in a similar way that you would do with acupuncture needles. Right? So acupuncture needles act as little antennas to bring chi, prana, life force to an area to uh, clear out energetic or emotional stagnation inside of whether you want to call it spirit, uh, ethereal body, ghost in the shell, all the words are valid. Right? Whatever works for you. But in essence, that thing that, that thing that floats inside this physical body, that uh, when it gets disconnected from it, produces and manifests disease. So emotional, emotional dissonance creating, uh, creating environments for propagating disease inside the physical body. So that's the, the didgeridoo is an effective tool in using its sound to clear out energetic stagnation, emotional stagnation. And what I do is I cross-reference and combine traditional Chinese medicine organ meridian theory with the Ayurvedic chakra theory. And that's a fancy way of saying I take and uh, this, any sound can have an effect on the physical body. So these singing bowls, these are actually in uh, C major, right? And in the Ayurvedic chakra system, the chakras are C, 
first chakra C, second chakra D, third chakra E, fourth chakra, so F, G, A, B, seven chakras, right? Each one having an emotional component to it, which interestingly enough will line up with the traditional Chinese medicine system. Um, so, going up just like a C scale, C major scale for those of you who know music. And you can take and use sound to entrain energetic stagnation so that it's no longer vibrating out of tune. So the subtle energy system inside of the Ayurvedic tradition vibrates. Those beige sounds or those seed sounds vibrate inside of traditional Chinese medicine. There's a vibration of the subtle energy system. And when you're using sound, whether it's bowls, the didgeridoo, listening to uh, music that soothes you, all those different things can have a therapeutic application. So that's the, the second way that the digit affects a person. Think of it as a new needle form of sound-based acupuncture. The third way the instrument affects a person is through the meditative. This is the most important thing that the didgeridoo does. I don't consider myself to be a healer. I don't think of the didgeridoo as a miraculous healing instrument. What it does is it creates an envelope of sound that helps people get into meditative states. So if you have never meditated before, have difficulty meditating, in most cases it tends to be a great set of training wheels. Uh, for people who meditate regularly, it tends to be a big up button allowing you to find your meditation faster and go there deeper. Um, and uh, meditation is the, it's the most important thing that the dish does. You know, the, um, you can take the first two, you know, that physiological aspect, that energetic aspect. If a person doesn't engage the fact that they're responsible for their own healing, those two things don't mean anything. They, they're they're, they're going to be temporary. Once you step into the driver's seat of your own personal healing, your own personal ability to manifest and heal what's inside of your body, because um, chiropractors, massage therapists, didgeridoo players, pharmaceuticals, doctors, they do not heal you. Healing is what occurs inside of you. I, uh, teach, uh, I was teaching a program for University of Pittsburgh Medical Center with a physician named uh, Dr. Michelle Thompson, who's been uh, one of the top physicians at UPMC for several years now. And uh, what she talks about is this um, embracing of uh, de-stressing, diet, exercise, lifestyle change. That, that aspect of lifestyle change is reducing stress to find your wellness, removing the components that keep us from healing, meditation being foundationally one of those big keys. Um, British Journal of Medicine, uh, AMA, the American Journal of Medicine, all of them talk about how meditation is a, in de-stressing is one of the foundational pieces of having optimal health. So again, that third piece, that meditative aspect, the most important thing that the didgeridoo does, helps people meditate. The other two things, bonus. So, questions on any of that so far? Really? No questions? Um, so what I would like to do is uh, do a meditation with you and uh, let you experience that. So we're gonna do a, uh, what is a, a basic journey and uh, when I started my practice uh, 15 years ago, one of the things that I had been uh, invited to was a traditional Native American drum journey, and I was invited back after that. So I played with, with the, uh, the drummer. They asked me to come back to another one, played with them again. It's like the third or fourth they invited me to. At halfway through, the drummers laid down, decided they weren't going to play drums anymore while I was playing, and they were going to meditate and journey. And then one of the ones after that, he said, hey, we're not going to play the drums tonight. We're just going to play the digit and we're going to journey to you. So that's what this was born out of. And um, the reason why I play four digits now, because at that time I only had one digit, um, my first sweat was with Thomas Wenwolf, who was the, the last full-blooded descendant of Chief Seattle and the spiritual leader of the 500 Nations while he was alive. And um, that experience had a, had a profound impact on a lot of aspects of my life. And one of the things that came forward from that experience was I've always liked this idea and, and been intrigued by this idea of the sound sweat. You know, you, you can find that space, that ceremony without, um, there, it exists out there for everyone. It doesn't have to be inside of, uh, it doesn't have to be found just inside of an EP or for somebody that goes to a church. You know, our, our spiritual worlds, our spiritual places exist beyond the confines of it has to be right there at that moment. But one of the things that One Wolf talked about is, 
after we got ready for the ceremony and we're inside the Anipi was that when we come together, we all come into the Anipi to sweat together, but we all sweat alone. And so much like that, my journeys have always been that way for people where we all come into a room and a space to experience meditation and journeying together. And that's the, that's the together part of it. But we're all doing this in our own space, in our own consciousness, on our own. So that's, the one asp that, that's one of the aspects that I like to bring into and explain to people when we do the journey. Because it is, it is the, the, the happiest, the friendliest, the least amount of work if you want it to be, you know, for whatever you want to connect with. And for me, from a practitioning standpoint, why I have four digits that I play is I'm just honoring the four directions. That's something that's about my spirituality and what I do. But it's, it's uh, that aspect of I'm journeying for myself also. Um, questions on any of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what do you call your practice, or what's, uh, um, I said practice? Of yeah, I have, a sound therapy, I have a sound therapy practice. Oh, so I do therapy. both group workshops like this, and then I also do individual work. Um, I've been doing that now for, for 15 years. The individual work is a lot like, uh, you'd be do it, a lot like a sound based, a combination of sound based acupuncture session mixed with the sound, the sound meditation. And then I do a variety of different workshops like this. You know, one this being more of a uh, informational, experiential, and then some of them like going into uh, chakra clearings, uh, quantum manifestation, quantum healing workshops, things like that. Yeah, uh, where is your practice in the Philippines? I actually I'm based out of uh, I'm based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I, I used to live in Portsmouth, and I tour nationally and internationally now doing this. But I, I live in uh, I live in Pittsburgh, and I come here to New England twice a year now. And you're originally from the Philippines, or is that your ancestor? That's why my, my mom's originally from the Philippines. My mother and my grandmother, yeah. My mom they grew up between the Philippines and Okinawa. And is there a reason you've never been to Australia? <laughs> uh, interestingly <laughs> enough, I was accepted to the University of Queensland in Brisbane when I was uh, at Syracuse. And mm -hmm. the reason why I, I did not go was because uh, it was, it, it, I didn't have the money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like I ran out of money for college at that point. Mm -hmm. So it was. You uh, can all relate. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That was the only reason. And and since then I I've often said I probably wouldn't be here if I had actually made it to Australia, because mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have come back. Uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the universe looking out for for me to be able to like be here and do what I'm doing today. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? It's a great question. Though. Yeah. yeah. I picked up the digit could just play. Uh, my first, so I woke up from a dead sleep in 1996, sat straight up and uh, said I'm going to play the didgeridoo and didn't really know what it was. I actually thought it was a bull roar and um, about six months after that I was at, at a shop in Portsmouth, New Hampshire and I, um, there was a basket of didgeridoos um, that in 2000, so this was in 19, 1997. Uh, in 2002, what ended up happening was I ran into the guy, so I'll come back around to that. He made my digits in Australia. But uh, I ended up picking up the dig out of the basket, and I went. And the woman looked around the corner and goes, Do you play the didgeridoo? I said, No. And she goes, Yes, you do. I held it up and Yes, I do. And uh, so that dig was a beautiful eucalyptus instrument, which I actually still have today, um, and my friends that I was with thought I was crazy for wanting to buy it. So the two, uh, the two ladies that were with us, my friend's wife and the woman I was dating at the time, uh, wouldn't let me buy it. So I bought a cheaper bamboo one, which I played all the way home from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, back to Merrimack. And this was before they put the, the highway in, so it's a long ride. And uh, by the time I got back to, to Merrimack, I'd split it in half from playing it. So I called up the shop and I said, hey, listen, this happened, you know, we hold that. So I ended up getting that dig. Fast forward to 2002 after I, so I had a, had a sax teacher, prior to that, I had a sax teacher when I was a kid that taught me the theory of circular breathing. And it took me about a week and a half. Somebody, somehow, either someone said something or I just knew, I don't really, like, but that I was supposed to circular breathe and I just kept trying and trying and trying. And um, after a week and a half of circular breathing by the end of the month, I was playing out blues and jazz performers because I was the manager of a blues and jazz bar. And um, 99, started playing with electronic dance music. And in 2002, I ended up uh, moving to Portsmouth. And I met a guy at, uh, who had just opened a shop, a world music shop that had all world music instruments. He had a bunch of didgeridoos. I started describing this dig I had. And he's like, I made that dig in Australia. I'm like, no, you didn't. He 
He's like, no, I did. He's like, that. And he had gone in 1996 to Catherine and had broken down on Bill Harney's land with, uh, with Bill's people and tribe. And uh, they had done a ceremony that they had wanted a group of people from all over the world to come to their land that they were going to teach how to make didgeridoos. And so Rob was one of these people that drifted onto their land and was called there, made a bunch of didges and came back with them to, and they wanted them to be played to just help with the, the, the vibration of the planet. So that's where it's all that, the, the lines are all intertwined with that story. But thank you for asking that. I just wondered, is there such a thing as a teacher of didgeridoos? Does everybody just pick it up and stop playing? You know what, I've been teaching now for probably about 10 years. That, that I started teaching not long, actually maybe 12. I started not long after my practice. I started my practice. Um, I have been completely uh, just humbled by the fact that it's not as, I tell people it's easy because this is what it is. I can really gets, I can, and it, you don't teach someone to play the did you coach them, because it's all about muscular physiology, there's no frets, there's no keys, it's, you, it's all about understanding how your body works. Um, some people can just pick, I've met people like me who pick it up and they can just play it, and I've had people that have been trying for years to, to, to be able to, to figure it out, and I, there's no rhyme, I can't figure out the rhyme or reason to it, really. So, and uh, I know that you know that some people are supposed to play, and, and it just it happens is, is what I've been told in, in some of the traditional beliefs. So. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no, I have a question. Do you um, play the same bowls, or do you use them in any of your sessions? I actually, so I do have some programs that I do use the bowls for a lot. Um, there's another. I have a, a group that I perform in called Ceremony of Sounds that there's a, a performer that usually does those the bulls, and um, Gong also, and does some voice work. Uh, I use them inside of uh, a chakra intensive workshop, where I'll just do some light toning on them, just to kind of keep people grounded into not just taking off, because the digits are also really effective at just getting them to go. So. Any other questions? Yeah. When you said that you bought a less expensive one to begin with, how much do those cost? These are on the high end. The one that I got back there was when I was uh, actually over 20 years ago now. Uh, I, it was just south of $400, and that was you know, 20, 20 some odd years ago. Uh, these are all of the all of the eucalyptus stitches that I play are uh, concert highs, um, which are the highest level. Of, so they range anywhere. They they start in a category that begins at. Uh, 750 Australian, and mine are usually quite above that, just because of the the, the quality. Like they're rated on a five, on a scale. There's five, there's different. There's resonance, back pressure, calls, um, well, amplitude, volume, all these different characteristics. So like the did, the eucalyptus stitches that I play from Did Shop, they're all what I they're like Stradivarius as instruments, and just the quality of the sound that they produce. Um, so, which brings me to these, which are in a completely different category. These two digits here are engineered instruments that were produced based on the spec that uh, we pulled off my eucalyptus set. Uh, there's a, a former MIT graduate, or an MIT graduate who is, uh, uh, owns a, a company that, in Corvallis, Oregon, that makes um, boat masts for um, yachts, and he, uh, is also a bagpipe player. After 9-11, it became really difficult to travel with all kinds of musical instruments, and he wasn't able to travel with his bagpipe chanters. So owning a company that makes stuff out of carbon fiber, he decided to start making carbon fiber bagpipe chanters. And uh, he knew a guy that played the dig, asked him to make a, a carbon fiber didgeridoo. I met him after he made his first prototype, and then we ended up making instruments together. So these are my my two carbon fiber digits, they produce concert class sounds, but they're just different. They're not better, they're not worse, they're just different. Um, and they allow me to change keys. Now, I don't change keys when I play, but I can tune them so that I can play different keys. So. Um, but yeah, any other questions before I, yeah. Do all didgeridoos have the same dimensions? They no, so length and diameter determines key. So like this is a C.
This is a D. I have this one tuned to... This one's tuned to B? No, this one's tuned to... I'll tell you when I hear it. This one's tuned to uh, A, and this one's tuned to B. So how do you go about tuning them? How do I tune them? Yeah. How do you tune a guitar? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you take your iPhone out of your pocket, <laughs> <laughs> right? And you take out your handy dandy tuner, and you. So length and diameter, they're no, um, they're no different than tuning any other um, aerophone or reed-based instrument. It's a, it's a woodwind. It's just a, it, it's, you can, and that's, that's the other interesting thing about, uh, about the, uh, so again, didgeridoo is not an aboriginal word, it's an onomatopoeia. So what it was was the, uh, the um, European Australians that showed up hearing traditional tribal playing and hearing a sound. <laughs> and then going, oh, that's the didgeridoo. But none, none of the tribal names are didgeridoo. Um, but I can play any uh, anything that's about an inch and a quarter at the mouthpiece, because that's the average size. Anything that's about an inch and a quarter, hollow the tube, that's over, you know, in the area of 46 inches longer, give or take a little shorter, depending. But that an inch and a quarter, 46 inch tube, will give you the key of D. So that'll give you this sound. So when I teach my students, I send them to the Home Depot or Lowe's or some hardware store, and I go, go buy a 46 inch piece of PVC, and get a little bit of beeswax, put that around the top just for comfort. It's not even for an airtight seal. And that's what you start on, because you spend five dollars, you do not want to spend this because you may or may not ever be able to play. So. I still want a question. How do you determine yeah. which um, note that you're going to use during your sessions? Like it's going to be G, A, G? So that's where I'll start referencing the Ayurvedic, right? So this, the, um, so first chakra, key of C, safety and security, self and family. The second chakra, key of D. Uh, it's relation, broadly relationships, all those things that go along with, with that. So not just romantic, but also work, relationships to you know, life, money, everything. Uh, third chakra, key of C, that's the uh, solar plexus. It's uh, our self-esteem, self-worth. Uh, lungs, or I'm sorry, uh, heart chakra, fourth chakra, key of F. It's this whole area, to love and be loved. Uh, throat is uh, fifth chakra, this is the key of G, and this, uh, our ability to express our highest truth, right? Third eye, this is our ability to perceive, visualize, manifest, bring things into being, uh, it's key of A, and then crown, so key of B, our connection to our higher consciousness, divinity, how we bring in our prana, our chi. Um, the, uh, what I typically do is like, the first thing I do if I'm doing a private session for someone is I'll say, what would you like to work on today? I don't sit there and try to, oh, what's going on? You know, I, it's not, I, a person will tell you what they want to work on. So, you know, oh, I've been dealing with this, I've been dealing with that. And so I'll build the sheet music of what to play for them in their session based on what they tell me is going on in their life and what they're wanting to work on. So if it's, uh, you know, I've been, uh, I've been struggling with, um, with, with food issues and I'm dealing with problems with my stomach, okay, well, that's the third chakra, I'm going to grab an eat. Uh, I've got some stuff going on with family, okay, key of C. Like, you'll hear inside of it, it's just simple triggers and clues to, like, grab it and then, you know, let them know this is what we're going to work on. We're going to work on first, third, and then we're going to seal it out with crown just to bring in that healing energy to, like, sort of smooth everything over. So it's, uh, people will tell you what's what's going on in the world if you just ask. So, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Do you have a mentor? You know, I had, I've had many throughout my life. There's no one. Um, nobody, no one no, nobody taught me how to do this specifically, but many people came together to help me figure it out. So like, I don't, 
I don't have, uh, there's no credit for like coming up with some exclusive system that I've made up. Um, all I do is I go into a hollow stick and make a raspberry, right? But uh, the, uh, the, the ideas of holistic uh, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, those, those belief systems and philosophies have been around for three to 5,000 years. So there's many people that have, that have come from, and there was lucky for me that there was a group of people that actually took an interest in helping me figure out how to apply those in a sound-based system. All right, so I'm going to dim the lights, and uh, I'm, what we'll do is uh, I would invite you to just be comfortable. And actually, if, if you do want to lie down on the floor, you're more than welcome to. Typically, in, in meditations that I do, people lie down on the floor. You don't have to if you like. Also, people will sit in chairs. I just recommend. Hands up, hands down, be comfortable, don't cross anything. Crossing from a uh, traditional Chinese medicine standpoint with the organ meridian system, you're crossing um, your meridians, so you want to be you know, nice, comfortable. And um, if you've never meditated before, just allow yourself to come into your breathing, just, you know, the in and the out. If there's an intention that you want to set, maybe there's some place in your body you know you want to send healing energy to. You can set that intention. I'd like to send some extra energy and love to my knees. You know, you can do that. If there's some wisdom you're looking for, or some info, you know, just some information, maybe that you can set the intention that the universe drops that in front of you really easily. You know, meditation is a uh, is just another form of connecting with whatever sense of divinity it is that you work with. Um, and then just let them go. Don't spend the next, you know. 25, 30 minutes going, I really want that to happen because that's not that's not how it's gonna work. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll miss the opportunity to relax. Um, any questions on meditation? No? You guys are awesome. So go ahead and just allow your eyes to close and your, your thoughts to come on your, your breathing and any intentions you'd like to set. Just take a few breaths to set those intentions. And then once you've done that, Just allow those intentions to be released to the universe, trusting that they've been received.
yourself to take a deep breath in. Beginning to invite awareness back into your fingers and toes. That awareness build into gentle movement, spreading into your arms and your legs. A good morning stretch over the top of your head. Just be more present to your physical body. And if you haven't already opened them, feel free to open your eyes whenever you're ready. How is everyone? Okay. Were you playing music the whole time? What's that? This is an odd question, but were you playing the whole time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. What's weird for me is I don't remember it towards the end. So. <laughs> yep, I was uh, playing the whole time. Wow. <laughs> um, and that was actually about half of what a normal, like, sort of normal meditation workshop that I would do would be closer to uh, 56 to 70 minutes of playing uh, was what you would, is what a person would, would experience. That was about 26, 25, 26 minutes. Um, one of the things, in, in especially in, in the, uh, the more of the journey, uh, uh, afterwards I always like to leave time for people to be able to share their experiences if, if they'd like to. So if you have a question or experience that you would like to share uh, with it, you're definitely welcome to do that. Now there's no obligations if you'd like to. If you have a question. Just, yeah. just with the circular breathing, Yeah. How, how are you doing that? I'm breathing in through my nose, out through my mouth. And when I need to use my, or when I need to take another breath, I use my cheeks like a bellows and a bagpipe to push the air out of my mouth while I'm breathing in through my nose. So the mechanics, the the, anatom the, the anatomy and physiology mechanics of it, you have your esophagus and your trachea. Yeah. So the epiglottis basically closes the, um, the esophagus while I'm breathing in through, while I'm pushing with my cheeks and breathing, using my nose to breathe down into my trachea. But it's just this. I have to breathe anyway, it's right? So, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really long. Yeah. So you physically push it on your cheeks and you do it. Well, it's closed as but it's a So if you the, so. the easiest way to explain it is if you fill your cheeks up with air. You have reserve. And then start breathing in through your nose. So just get a mouthful of air and gargle the air. And so if you could figure out how to let that air in your mouth now go up really, really gently through those lips while you're breathing in and out through your wow. nose, that's what I'm doing. So it's a, it's, a, it's a physiological mechanic with the muscles that you don't typically do because you have to disassociate your face muscles from the but it, You can't think about it. It's like shooting a free throw. If I thought about it, my, my average would be as good as Shaq's. So. <laughs> Another question or comment? You would like to share their experience? Yeah. Um, I've done Tai Chi for a long time, so I usually get the energy in my yeah. hands. It's usually a constant energy. But what did yeah. you do? It was like pulsing. With the, mm. with the did you do? It's like faster and slower. And I've never felt that before. So, so I, that was pretty amazing. Um, I've done, been invited to do radio shows. I've actually done uh, uh, the Qi Long work that I've done also. Yeah. Um, the, uh, having the having the digit and, you know, and, and again I don't it's sound work in general will provide a level of of, um, of uh, amplifying your access to chi so I don't like to I don't like to say it's just exclusively the dig the dig is really good at what it does mm -hmm. and in those qigong classes tai chi classes which I've done work with uh, reiki programs they always describe it as like having a conduit of of chi that just drops right in mm -hmm. so, yeah. Another comment or anything that anyone would like to share? Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, when you're when you're um like when you're in your mouth, how does the didgeridoo make the like how does it make the music? The sound? Yeah. So I'm literally going So if you can make a motorboat sound, you can play the didgeridoo. Um. It's that easy. Comments or questions? Um, I don't know if the meditators says calming, but 
I am sweating like I've just been in the gym. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I saw you at one point. You were white. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's the third piece, uh, the third one that you were playing. Uh, Which would have been uh, I actually played. That was Crown. Yeah. Well, I was I I, I do meditation, but I was meditating all the chakras right yes. in a circle like this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm literally so. <laughs> that's you know, and that's an interesting. So from a from a, a traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic standpoint, that is a uh, it's a release, which I'm sure yes. you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Very. Drink lots of water tonight. Very. Yeah. For sure, drink lots of water. No need to go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If it could always be that easy, right? <laughs> um. Oh. One other thing that I've got. No, please. Um, you said to don't cross your feet or hands. Yeah. What would happen if you cross? You can't. I mean, it's it, it's not a there's, so there's no. It's it's a suggestion based on traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, ac, it, it's essentially the acupuncture theory, which I'm grounded in from from my mentors. And you just when you're when you go into an acupuncture session, you don't want to do a bunch of this. Because the whole point is that your meridians, you're trying to get your meridians to flow, so you're going to create, you're going to create a blocking point oh. where that is. Okay, yeah, I did a TN back in college days, and they said, in your position, don't cross your feet or hands. And I wonder if that's for the same reason. Um, TM is oh transcendental meditation. Yeah, it's know. going to be the same thing. Yeah. It's it's all it's all of that energy work, all of that meditation work. The idea is to be as open, even if you think about shavasana. So like all of these cultures convergently evolved the same philosophies. Like no one has the, the, the trademark or the patent on it, right? Shavasana, corpse pose. You know, this is what it is. It's about you do all of that yoga, you do all of that work. So that, just like Tai Chi, which yoga is another form of Tai Chi, Tai Chi is a form of yoga if you want to like, look at them, they're opposite sides of the same coin. That whole movement and, and getting into your physical being that way is so that when you stop moving, you can feel the energy inside your body. You can feel your subtle energy system. So when you're laying there, that's what that is. All of that work is for that, that moment of stillness to be able to experience the, the uh, subtle energy system, the non-corporeal part of your being. Um, one thing that I, I started to say earlier and I didn't fully go into um, about the didgeridoo and the, the age and the, the Aboriginal tribes. So again, they're the foundationally the, the culture that uh, has the oldest connection to the instrument, but multiple cultures convergently evolved and have had the didgeridoo as part of their culture. So you have um, here on this continent, the Maya had what was called the Mayan horn, which they made out of agave. Uh, in Peru, uh, Peru has a vibrant didgeridoo culture that is part of that. And when I was in Peru in 2005, I ended up uh, doing work with a bunch of shamanic uh, didgeridoo players who are also part of a shamanic rock band. If you're ever going to find a shamanic rock band, you're just going to find them. Um, and then, again, the Southeast Asians and the Filipinos also have their own didgeridoo cultures. The Filipinos play in, uh, out of bamboo. The Southeast Asians make what are called board wood, where they bore it out with, uh, they, they bore out the centers. Uh, so there's, there has been multiple cultures that have convergently evolved them, you know, with respect to the Aboriginal people having been the ones who uh, came across it the oldest amount of time, but then the convergent evolution of vibrating your lips into a hollow stick to make that sound is something that's been around amongst many cultures for thousands of years. So, any other questions? I have... Um, CDs for everybody. Uh, for those of you who still have CD players, or if you know someone who does, they're my gift to you. Uh, you can also, if you know someone that you would like to give one to that wasn't able to make it tonight, that if you think that they would like it. Um, and next to the CDs, there's a, uh, a card that has a picture of me on it on the back if you flip it over. It has all the information on how you can stream not only my meditation stuff, but my musical stuff for free. All of my library is out there for free. There's no reason to pay for it. So you can do, you know, Spotify, whatever it is, that, whatever your favorite streaming service is that's out there, all of that stuff is on that. Um, and thank you again for having thank me you. in your library.